welcome to the University of New South Wales Canberra Australian Naval History podcast series, produced in partnership with the Naval Institute, the Naval Historical Society, Navy's Sea Power Centre and the Submarine Institute. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoy this podcast and return for others in the series. I'm Professor Tom Frame, a former Naval Officer and Director of the Australian Centre for the Study of Armed Conflict and Society at the Defence Force Academy. The centre hosts the very active Naval Studies Group at UNSW Canberra. So please visit our website. To find us, simply Google Naval Studies Group and UNSW Canberra. Ours will be the first website in the search results. This podcast looks at a complex and controversial incident from the Second World War. The incident itself is straightforward. The aftermath was complicated. On the evening of the 12th of March 1942, the Royal Australian Navy's flagship, the cruiser HMAS Australia, was steering in company with other naval ships in the Coral Sea to the northeast of the Australian mainland. At about 7.40 in the evening, screams were heard on the ship's forecastle. They came from 19-year-old Stoker John Riley. He'd been stabbed 14 times. Initially conscious, and able to speak, he succumbed to his wounds and died the next day. Then followed the most famous court-martial in Australian naval history. The case went all the way to the High Court, with reverberations for the Admiralty in London as well. To discuss the HMAS Australia court-martial, I'm joined today by a tremendous panel of experts. That includes Mike Carlton, well-known broadcaster and the author of three bestsellers on Australian naval history. His 2016 book, Flagship, dealt with this incident. We also have Rear Admiral James Goldrick of the Naval Studies Group, whose 1984 Masters of Letters thesis on the HMAS Australia Court Martial brought the matter to contemporary attention. And finally, on the panel, we have two distinguished naval lawyers, Associate Professor Cameron Moore, who lectures at the Australian National University the University of New England and the University of Wollongong, and Associate Professor David Letts, Director of the Military Law Program at the Australian National University and its College of Law. Gentlemen, thanks for making the time to speak with us today. James Goldie, if I could begin with you, could you give us a brief outline of the crime and the initial investigation? The important thing to understand is nobody saw the assault occur. Um, Stoker Riley was uh, on the upper deck of HMAS Australia in darkness. The screams were heard. People within a few minutes came to the scene to find him with two other men, uh, leading Stoker Gordon and uh, Stoker Elias. They were covered in blood. Uh, Riley was clearly very badly hurt and there was immediate action to take Riley to the sick bay um, and to try and work out what had happened but nobody saw what happened, and although Riley had 14 stab wounds, no weapon was ever found. Well, presumably it was thrown overboard. Uh, did that come out in the investigation? It was always implicit that it was thrown overboard, but it was never proven. And although uh, Elias and Gordon were convicted of the murder, no, it was all done purely on circumstantial evidence, and it was the nature of that evidence uh, that made, that created some of the problems that, f that followed. What happened was that there was an investigation. Uh, the investigation did take a statement from the dying Riley. Who took the statement? Was it a coxswain? Was it another sailor? Was it an officer? There weren't police on board, so how did that happen? It does appear that the executive officer of the ship, Commander Jamie Armstrong, uh, took personal charge of the investigation and indeed was the one who was questioning Riley and anybody else directly involved in the uh, incident. Uh, so he very much led this investigation. Um, it would seem that he had some idea of the potential motive. He questioned Riley, and one of the key points was that although Riley said that um, uh, Elias and Gordon had attacked him and explained the motive, Riley was uh, not told that he was dying and he lapsed into unconsciousness before that statement could uh, be basically given the status it needed, which is it had to be, uh, Riley had to know he was dying 
to confirm uh, what he'd alleged in order for it to be in evidence. But Elias and Gordon didn't run away. No, they went up to the bridge to find what was called the principal control officer, who was the senior officer responsible for the readiness of the ship um, at that time, uh, to try and say that they'd been the first on the scene, uh, that they'd heard the cries, uh, that the blood on, on their uh, clothing and bodies was because they'd been the first to help Riley, who of course was bleeding massively from 14 stab wounds. Uh, so they were trying to convey a story uh, from the start that they were the first on the scene they hadn't seen any others than shadows, um, and, but there had been a, a knife, uh, but that had disappeared. But were they arrested and taken to the brig? You know, people often think when they hear about these things, there's a prison on board a ship and they're clapped in irons and taken away. How were they treated? What, what initially happened? Uh, they were um, left on the bridge, uh, it, it, it would appear, for some time. Then they were taken and given an initial interview, and it appears they were then confined late at night. Um, and I think as much, while suspicion fell on them immediately, uh, there was also, a, I think, a feeling that if they weren't confined, then there was total uncertainty in the ship that a, a murderer may be loose in the ship, and who knows what else is going to happen. Uh, certainly the accounts of survivors um, many years later uh, did say that people in the ship were pretty Bit concerned nervous. about what had happened. Yeah. James, let me ask you, Captain Harold Farncombe, commanding officer of HMAS Australia, his main focus is the war and winning at sea, and yet he has to deal with this major disciplinary issue on board, which has a, the opportunity to affect morale and the general well-being of his ship's company. How did he approach this? And in terms of what Australia was doing, what was its effect? Captain Farncombe's main concern was to ensure that the ship remained an efficient fighting unit and that meant that he had to have a crew that was cohesive and content whose morale was, was solid. So he has a deep problem that he has to deal with this as quickly and effectively as he can because if he doesn't, what happens is that he erodes the efficiency of the ship at a time when HMAS Australia is most needed. It's one of the worst periods of the war Coral Sea battle is yet to be fought. The Japanese seem to be advancing everywhere. And the Australia is one of the most important units in the naval defence of the region. So at the very point of time where operational effectiveness, he wants to be highest, he's got this event happening on board, but he wants to keep this an effective fighting ship. Does he do that? Yes, he does. He acts very quickly. He clearly acts with great determination. What he doesn't do is conduct a witch hunt in the ship. Um, he keeps it confined to the two people who he believes have committed a terrible crime and he is trying to convey to all concerned that it's being dealt with as quickly and effectively as possible. Now this is uh, Mike Carton, an intensely human story. What can you tell us about Stoker John Riley, the victim, and the assailants, uh, Albert Gordon and Edward Elias? What do we know about them as people? We don't know a lot because they, they sort of move in and out of the shadows of history. Uh, Stokers were pretty much the lowest form of, uh, of naval life. They, they messed apart from other sailors. They did mysterious things in the bottom of the ship. So not a lot was known of, of these three. Riley himself, the victim, uh, was just 19 years old from uh, Bella Reeve in Tasmania. Uh, only a little bloke, uh, just 162 centimetres tall. In fact, all three of them were, were quite small. None of them topped more than about 170 centimetres. Um, I interviewed a survivor of the ship, a bloke called Jack Langrell, who was the canteen assistant on board uh, Australia, and therefore in a position to know pretty much everyone in the crew. He described um, Riley as, uh, quotes, a real cheeky little fella and a bit of a pug. Apparently, he liked to fight. Uh, the other two, the, uh, the killers, Albert Ronald Gordon, uh, was 23. He was born in Britain. Uh, surprisingly, his elder brother was, uh, was a naval officer in the RAN, uh, in fact, in a, a naval observer, and he died just before this, uh, this murder in an attack on the, the pocket battleship Admiral Shear and the heavy cruiser of Prince Eugen. But uh, Gordon himself, 23 years old, was, uh, was an orphan. His, his elder brother was his only next of kin. And the, uh, the other one, Edward Joseph Elias, also 23, 
uh, the son of a widowed mother. Again, uh, another small bloke. He'd been in a bit of trouble he'd, in the Navy. He'd been um, absent without leave a couple of times. He'd gone adrift and um, was busted back from the rank of leading stoker. So he'd been in a spot of trouble. But again, Langle, Jack Langle, the canteen assistant, knew them both. And his quote, which surprised me, was they were both nice, lovely men, he told me. They always looked immaculate. Uh, they were nice people. So they're most unlikely killers, you might think, on first inspection. Yeah, and one thing, it, it always puzzled me, is why the stabbing? It would have been so easy simply to have pushed Riley overboard on a dark night. Boom, like that, gone. Instead of ending up covered in blood with sharks and, and heaven knows what, I'd, now, why they decided on a stabbing, uh, we do not know. Uh, the, uh, there were any number of theories about it. A, a homosexual love triangle gone wrong, or, or as Riley himself claimed, um, uh, they were, you know, they were going to—he uh, was—they were going to blackmail him, and so on and so on. So we don't know why, but it always puzzled me that they went for stabbing. So it surprised their uh, mates on the mess deck that they were in fact so violent. Well, the entire ship was uh, was rocked to the core, and as, as, as James Goldrick pointed out, there was there was a great fear on board that there was a, a murderer on the loose, a fear that was not fully calmed even when they were they were uh, confined. So, James Goldrick, let me come back to you. And the ship is traumatized; plenty two men are dead. It's a violent attack. Um, Harold Farncombe, the commanding officer, his first thought, of course, is to fighting and winning the war. He's been if you like, distracted by this major disciplinary incident. Can you tell us a little bit about Harold Farncombe and how, according to his character, he would have approached this particular incident? Harold Farncombe was an extremely intelligent, highly professional and very dedicated man. Um, he was not the most personable of people, but it's absolutely clear that he was dedicated to being the captain of HMS Australia and acutely aware of his responsibility for the ship, but also for a people. And I think what's clear is his uh, determination to settle this matter. Uh, it is a determination, I think, to settle it fairly, uh, but what he's got, what he's always aware of, that if he doesn't settle it, if it isn't sorted out, then the danger to the ship's morale, to its cohesion, uh, to the confidence uh, of the ship's company in each other, uh, is threatened at a time when the ship is one of the most important units in the Australian Navy at one of the worst times of the war for Australia. Because they're hugely busy at this time. 1942, uh, the war is not going well for Australia or the Allies, is it? It's still a very difficult period of the war and Australia is a vital part of the naval de defences um, in the area. So Farncom is really worried about the effect on the ship and he has to tread a very fine line. Um, what he can't do, for instance, is initiate a witch hunt uh, to try and you know, see if other people are connected with this unless he had absolutely hard evidence. And what's quite clear is that they had no hard evidence um, of anything outside this. It's other than Riley's statement, um, there's nothing. There may have been a feeling, and of course ships, you know, one develops a sense as to things are going on, you get snippets of information from around the ship. But really, he had almost nothing to go on. And what he had to do was act in a way that was going to ensure the ship remained an effective fighting unit. So he's fair but firm, wanting to keep this in perspective while never letting sight of the fact that it is a warship on operations in wartime. That's exactly it. And he's got these several hundred people on board, many of whom are very young, and many of whom have been at sea since the beginning of the war with Germany. Um, they've not had much time off. They're in a non -air, an unair conditioned ship in tropical and subtropical conditions. They're working 14 hours a day. Um, it's just going on and on. So he has to keep that thing together. David, let's, let me ask you, was this always going to end up in a court martial? And just for those mm. Uh, who are our viewers who don't know what a court-martial is, where do they come from and what kind of conditions are required for one to be convened? Sure. Um, the short answer is no. It was not always going to end up in a court-martial. In fact, in the ordinary course of events, um, a civil trial for the crime of murder would have taken place. 
But as James has just indicated, Australia was a vital unit um, for the Australian Navy and the requirement that would have arisen for a civil uh, criminal trial uh, for witnesses in particular to be um, available for that, that trial would have potentially, including the captain of the ship potentially, would have taken the uh, vessel out of operation for a considerable period and, and that was not um, tenable for the naval authorities. So a, a decision was made that a court-martial would be convened. And a court-martial uh, is, is a military tribunal, a disciplined tribunal, that has a wide-ranging jurisdiction that can encompass the most basic breaches of naval or military discipline, uh, somebody who hasn't uh, got their, their kit clean or their, their shoes polished correctly or uh, is, is a little insubordinate to a superior, for example. So minor matters to major matters can all be covered by a court correct, martial. Correct, correct. And, and in this case, um, a very major matter, a, a capital offence one that um, could result and, and did result in, the, um, in a conviction and the awarding of the punishment of death. So um, a very serious matter. Court martial, naval court martials were subject to a, um, a rather convoluted legal system dating back to 1866, uh, an act of the British uh, government and, uh, and various amendments through a number of mechanisms um, that, that had taken place subsequently. But um, the interesting thing for the Australian Navy in 1942, and it was subsequently found uh, as part of the High Court proceedings that followed, but an interesting thing was the Australian Naval Force was entirely under the 1866 Act. And so any amendments that had been made because of Australia's legislation following the Federation didn't apply because of the manner in which naval forces, and only the naval forces, not the Army um, and Air Force, had been placed at the disposal of the United Kingdom. So I'm thinking here of something that happened in 1902 in South Africa, which was the execution of Morant and Hancock during the South African War. A lot of the folklore around that is the Australian government said, well, we're not going to have our people executed by, uh, if you like, the authorities of another country. Would, were they surprised in, in, in Navy office and in both the Commonwealth government that here would be Australians subject to British law and could be condemned under conditions where the Australian law couldn't intervene or they themselves as authority play a part? I, I think they ended up being surprised. It, it was not realised when the um, decision was made, and it was a very good decision, it was for operational reasons to, to have Australian naval forces being able to interoperate and Australian naval officers in particular to be able to go and command British vessels and, and, to, have, and, and to serve other um, command roles, not just as commanding officer in British vessels, and to have no question about discipline arrangements. So on that basis, um, it was sound, and, th and that was the expected outcome. I suppose what was not expected was that um, a crime of this magnitude would take place on one of the Australian naval vessels, uh, and, and then each consequence that arose from it uh, would then uh, arise in the way it did with uh, eventually a pardon being needed from the king uh, for the, for the two, to, to commute the death penalty to life imprisonment. So there'd never been uh, in an Australian warship a situation where someone had been found guilty of a capital crime and convicted, uh, at, rather had been sentenced to death up until this point? Uh, I'm unaware of any such incident. James. I think, in fact, under the Australian Naval Discipline Act, um, only treason could acquire a, um, a death penalty via a court-martial. Every other um, crime, it was a lesser penalty. But no one had been so charged and so convicted up until that point? No. no. Mm. Cameron. Yes, that's the key difference. So the, the Naval Discipline Act 1886 in the Imperial scheme provided capital punishment for murder. Uh, and I'll just add to James' point, and in the Australian scheme, only for treason, but also mutiny and desertion. Yeah, mutiny and desertion, yeah. So, so just help us with this, because I know some of the, the viewers will be interested. If the sentence had been carried out, where would it have been carried out? Well, well the... Or is that not clear? Well, well the, um, the court-martial ordered that they be hung from the yard arm in naval tradition. And so if, if the uh, sentence had been carried out as awarded, 
potentially it would have occurred on board HMAS Australia. In Probably front after. Of, in front of the crew. After divine service on a Sunday and they were left there in that kind of fashion, it takes us back almost 200 years. Um, so the, the players at the court martial, there's the court, who is the court and who's the prosecutor in all of this and who's the defending officer? Just let us know. And, and Trevor Rapke, a figure whose name resonates through naval history, where does he come in all of these proceedings? Sure. The, um, the court had to, uh, there was a number of requirements for a court martial, naval court martial. First of all, there had to be, uh, well, the Act stipulated three ships, but by that stage, uh, two was the requirement. There had to be two ships together. That didn't mean that the officers had to come from both ships, but uh, in this case, that ended up being the case. So officers from Leander, which was the other vessel that was in company, and HMAS Australia. There was a requirement for at least five and no more than nine officers to sit uh, as the court. No senior sailors? Uh, no, no senior sailors, all, all officers. In terms of the prosecutor, uh, the naval requirement, the tradition was that the captain of the vessel, so in this case, Harold Farncombe, should act as prosecutor, and that's indeed what did happen. Uh, Harold was not legally trained, uh, like every other commanding officer at that time, uh, so, but nevertheless, that was his role. Because of the nature of the offence, the seriousness with which the consequences could be if a guilty conviction was found, a decision was made to find a legally qualified officer to defend the accused, uh, defend both of them. So one officer provided to defend both, which some might think could provide certain problems. Because it's a bit tricky, because if Elias had said Gordon correct. didn't, Gordon said Elias. And the other thing, let me just ask, it does seem a little unfair. Harold Farquhar, the prosecutor, is not legally trained yet the defendant is legally trained. Could you say that that was stacked in favour of the defence? Well, uh, possibly, but, but I think as, as things progress, we'll see that that may not have been the case. So um, the Navy did have in its um, employ at that stage a, a, an officer who was a, a lawyer, criminal lawyer from the Victorian Bar, Trevor Rapke. Rapke was serving in Darwin, the city at the time, and a decision was made that he would be um, uh, taken to uh, Australia, which at this stage was back off Numea, and provided as the accused's friend was the, uh, the term that was used in those days, otherwise known as a defending officer. So Rapke uh, was quite a, a skilled and successful uh, junior barrister at the Victorian Bar, uh, and in that sense, uh, in terms of those who were available to the Navy, uh, he was a very good choice. In terms of Rapke as a man, interestingly, uh, his family had a, a history of activism. His mother was, was a activist. Politics. Uh, no, not politics, but, but uh, worrying and, and uh, advocating for those who, who were less fortunate. So social reform. Exactly, that mm. type of thing. So, so he, he'd been brought up in an environment where that was um, not or that was quite usual, that, that concern for those who were in trouble was part of his um, demeanour. So uh, in, terms of, in terms of selecting someone, I think uh, Rapke, although he was a lieutenant at the time, uh, and so there's quite a rank difference between Captain Farncombe and Lieutenant Rapke, um, certainly the proceedings showed that there was um, quite a vigorous engagement between Rapke and Farncombe and the court, and he carried out his duties as defending officer um, very skillfully and very thoroughly. So would people say, as a general observation, this was a fair trial? Well, could, could you say that about it? Well, people. Um, ultimately, it was found to be the case in the High Court. Um, so uh, Farncombe uh, made errors. He made errors. At, at, I'll give you one example. In his summing up, Farncombe uh, told the court of his conviction as captain of the ship, that and that's the, pretty weighty. The, the accused were both guilty, yeah. that he had no doubt. <laughs> um, and of course, that was an immediate ground upon which Rapke objected. The fact that you've got the captain of, of the vessel uh, telling the court that he has no doubt that these two accused are guilty. Um, so nevertheless, and, and there was criticism of that uh, uh, approach by Farncombe, but the, the High Court did not find that there'd been any miscarriage 
and nor did a subsequent inquiry, miscarriage of justice. And the penalty, the death penalty, was that the only one open to the court martial? Did they have choices? And was the death penalty probably what you would expect they would have received? My understanding uh, is that the death penalty was the only one available in this, uh, for this crime. And Mike Carlton, let me ask you, um, how did this news, uh, how was it greeted in both Navy Office and the government? I mean, here was a ship at sea in the middle of war, two men uh, convicted, condemned to death. What was the response in Melbourne and in Canberra? Uh, I think consternation would probably cover it because it was a very, very difficult problem uh, constitutionally as well. Uh, Navy officers entirely knew that there was no death penalty under Australian law for this crime or naval law. Uh, so the Naval Board very quickly passed the case on to the, uh, the then Labor Attorney General, uh, Herbert V. Evert, Doc Evert. And uh, they moved pretty quickly. On, on the 27th of April, not uh, you know, just weeks after the crime, lawyers for Gordon and the last killers went to the High Court for a, a writ of habeas corpus, which stopped the execution in its tracks. And then so began this tremendous legal and constitutional struggle. The Australian people were only dimly aware of it. The, the, the court martial had been held in secret for very sound reasons. One, uh, murder on board a flagship would have been an absolute gift for Japanese propaganda. They didn't want that. And two, they didn't want the Japanese, obviously, to know that the, uh, the ship was out of action for any extended period. So the thing was held in secret. And news only began to filter out when uh, the civil courts got involved, the, the, the high court and so on. Even then, even then it was just referred to as a crime on board, a warship of the RAN and so on. But it presented the government with a very, very difficult problem indeed because the, the, the Labor Party, and I dare say large sections of the conservative side of politics, did not like the idea of the death penalty, were, were dead set against it. And there were echoes, as, as someone has mentioned, of the, uh, the break Morant, Lieutenant Hancock um, uh, trial during the Boer War. So the Labor government, the Curtin Labor government, realised it had a large problem on its hands that only grew more complex as they dug into it. And Mike, there was really a movement, wasn't there, even at this stage against the death penalty. I think the last execution in New South Wales had been in 1939. I don't believe there was an execution after then. So the mood, would you say more broadly, was, was, was against the death penalty in this period? Um, no, probably not. Victoria still had the death penalty you know, until well after the war, well after the war. Uh, but th there was a f also, I suppose, there was a bit of pommy bashing involved as well. There was, there was the idea that why should we sub be sub subject to, uh, to British law? And, that, and that's where uh, the Hancock and, uh, and Brake Morant case was invoked. You know, everyone thought uh, Lord Kitchener was a terrible fellow who had them shot. And there would have been echoes of, of that in, in this as well. And do we know how the two condemned men themselves greeted uh, the sentence? Did they, were they expecting it? Were they resigned to their fate? Or were they still hopeful? They maintained their innocence all the way through uh, and, and, and never wavered in that. Um, what their reaction was, we don't know. Uh, they, they, they virtually disappeared from history. Uh, they remain there in name only from, from this point on. Uh, but they had their defenders, and as the trial and, and as the news of the affair became more and more public, as it was bound to do, uh, there was in fact a, a great outcry against the death penalty. Um, there were you know, bishops of the Catholic and Anglican Church got involved, uh, and there, there was a great movement to have this death penalty uh, to set aside. But nobody knew how to do it for all the difficult legal and constitutional reasons. Could, could the king grant a, par a pardon? Who should apply to the king? Uh, Ever the Australian Attorney General started to badger the British to do something. The British, quite understandably, had more weighty things on their mind than a distant colonial naval murder, and so and got more and more bogged down. Um, but there, there was, in the end, uh, quite a large public outcry about it. David, let's. How are you understanding, though, this period of both, if you like, general Australian history and legal history with respect to the death penalty? Well, the, the other, one other interesting fact is not only was it uh, British law that was being applied, but the President of the Court Martial and a number of members were also Royal Navy officers. So if, um, if the public uh, wished to make something of that, you've got both British law plus a President of the Court Martial and a number of officers on the Court Martial who have uh, convicted the, uh, the two accused. So I think the point that Mike's making about perhaps a, a little bit of 
pommy bashing um, has got a number of streams to it where that could arise. Mm. And James, they found guilty, uh, they've been sentenced to death, but the captain of all people, the one who we've heard, was not at all uh, unconfident that they were the guilty parties. He writes a letter of mitigation. Why does he do this? He does. This is where what became service legend clashes with fact. Uh, the ship's company seemed to have been convinced that Captain Farncombe wanted to take the ship to sea and hang the sailors at the yard up. And that became really you know, received uh, legend uh, for the next 30 or 40 years. It's not the case. Farncombe was convinced of their guilt, but it's equally clear that he did not believe the death sentence should be applied. And he writes a letter of mitigation uh, to the Admiral, which is obviously going, going to get passed to Navy office, and it's a remarkable letter. What he does in that letter is describe what the sailors have gone through since the ship recommissioned from refit just as the war started. And he talks about uh, the conditions and how young the ship's company are. And he develops the theme that being away from home for so long, being uh, caught in that ship, uh, confined in that ship with so many other men for so long, creates what he called an abnormal, unnatural, and, and perhaps perverse state of mind. And it's clear to me those are code for um, the motive which could not have, which was not brought into the court martial and couldn't be. Um, but what he's saying is that they're, you know, they're not, the people who've committed this murder are frankly not in their right mind. And that while it may have been a deliberate act, the conditions are such that they don't deserve to die for it. So he's known in some circles to be a hard man, Harold Farncombe, but there's a compassion and an empathy that probably hasn't, uh, if you like, attached to his reputation uh, in general writing about the Australian Navy. No, and, and it's really interesting that the ship's company continued to have that idea about uh, what he wanted to do to the sailors. And I think what they confused was his um, clear belief that they were guilty with his belief about what should happen to them. So the quality of mercy was not unknown to him? Not at all. Mm. Now, Cameron... Can I add a bit in there? Is that possible? I, I've, I've done a bit of a study of Farncombe I mean, in two books. First, in, when he was in command of the cruise of Perth, and second, in this, in this occasion, when he was in command of Australia. And he had the reputation of a, of a, a doer, inflexible martinet. And yet the letter that James refers to is one of quite extraordinary compassion, and it speaks very highly of him, one, uh, as an officer, and two, as a Christian, and he was, he was a devout Christian, and three, as a human being. I, I think it adds an enormous luster to his reputation, but it's a little known. No, I think that's right, and I just know my own reading, you, there's, there's, Harold Farncombe has this severity about him that, uh, that you know, as we've been discussing, uh, seems to have been, at least on one level, unfair. Cameron, now, this case ends up, of all places, in the High Court. How and why does this occur? As has been mentioned already, uh, the uh, counsel on behalf of, the, of Elias and Gordon sought a writ of habeas corpus, because by this stage they're in Long Bay Jail, uh, awaiting the outcome of whatever may transpire. So those that don't know any Latin, tell us what that means and why you would invoke it. Literally, it means to bring up the body. It's an ancient writ, it goes back to Magna Carta. So uh, it was within the original jurisdiction of the High Court to be able to grant the writ of habeas corpus and it's actually addressed to the Governor of Long Bay Jail to, for the Governor of Long Bay Jail to say why you should hold these bodies, so to speak. And uh, that creates a few interesting strands in the High Court judgment, which perhaps not so important from a naval point of view, but they are important from a constitutional point of view as to what, uh, under what authority are they being held in Long Bay Jail? And there's some query about the warrants that were issued by Admiral Crais, the uh, commander of the squadron and so on, as to why they should be in Long Bay Jail. But the, the nub of the matter is the writ of habeas corpus and uh, have, should they be, um, what was the authority of the court martial to, to hold them and to uh, issue the death penalty for murder and this issue that we've already discussed about the difference between the Australian legislation and the British uh, Naval Discipline Act. So there's important principles the High Court has been asked to consider. Yes, and the other strand that they consider is the uh, urging of Captain Farncombe that uh, 
he believes personally that these men are guilty. So that also comes up. But I think the key issue is whether uh, these men should be subject to uh, the British Naval Discipline Act only, and therefore there's a, uh, a capital sentence for murder, which would not happen if it was under the Australian legislation. So what impressed the High Court in the case that was brought to it, and what did it end up deciding? It ended up deciding that the Governor-General had put the Australian fleet at the disposal of the Admiralty. And the effect of that was that uh, British naval law applied. And whatever Australian legislation had to say in the light of um, Morant and Hancock did not apply to sailors serving aboard Australian ships which had been placed at the disposal of the Admiralty. And a critical point there is that Australia had not adopted the Statute of Westminster, which would have made all the difference if it had. So what happened as a consequence of this High Court ruling? Uh, it may help to explain the Statute of Westminster first and then to say what then happened. So the Imperial Conference of 1926, which was uh, a result of the Dominions having a seat at the table at the Treaty of Versailles negotiations at the end of the First World War, decided that each of the Dominions should be able to govern its own affairs. The uh, Imperial Parliament passed the Statute of Westminster in 1931. Australia was then, to, to ha take advantage of that, had to then pass its own legislation, which it did not, and nor did New Zealand. Because? Now, there are, there are various reasons given for Australia not adopting the Statute of Westminster prior to that, but part of them are that the, nature, the state of the Federation was unsettled in the 1930s. Western Australia had voted to secede. Uh, Jack Lang in New South Wales had um, tried to sever financial ties with the Commonwealth. So there was a great deal of uh, disturbance in the Federation, and it seemed that the time was not right. So, so Menzies, one more complication we don't need. Is that how it was seen? Yes, it's often seen as uh, we're, we're too t attached to the mother country, but I, I think that's much more to it than that. Uh, Menzies, as, as Attorney General, had tried to bring an Adoption Act in the 1930s and had been unsuccessful, I think, politically, and, and, and it had lapsed. So at, at this stage, Doc Evatt, who's already been mentioned, who's Minister for External Affairs and Attorney General, perhaps sees the opportunity to uh, adopt the Statute of Westminster Act. Now, the significance of that is that um, effectively the, the Commonwealth Parliament, the Parliament of Australia, gets legislative independence from the Westminster Parliament. The British have been wanting to give it to Australia, and Australia has wanted to take it. And part of that is because um, imperial legislation could prevail over Australian legislation without getting too technical. Uh, and that doesn't look good, it doesn't feel good, and to pick up Mike Carlton's point, um, there's a mood against that in the electorate, isn't there? Yes and no. The West Australians probably really wanted to be able to go back to the Parliament of, in Westminster to prevail over those Canberra politicians, uh, and perhaps uh, Jack Lang in New South Wales might have wanted the same thing as well. So I don't think it's a neat right. uh, Australian nationalist narrative. I think it's a bit more to do with, about, uh, with federalism and the power of the centre as opposed to the power of the states. And that's why I think we didn't have the Statute of Westminster adopted until 1942. But I think Everett sees his opportunity arising out of the court martial and the High Court decision that maybe now's the time <laughs> to, for the Commonwealth to assert itself a little bit more against the states and saying legislative power in Australia stops with the Commonwealth Parliament. It doesn't continue on to the Parliament at Westminster. So it's not surprising in one sense, given the complexities, and we've only just touched on the outline of them, should take it to the High Court. The High Court could then see that it's got wider ramifications. So it's more than about a man being murdered on a naval ship. Yes. It's, uh, it's a very, very big story that's in, in, in front of the country. But there's another further review, isn't there, before this matter is finally dealt with as far as the courts are concerned? Yes. Uh, so Justice Maxwell of the New South Wales Supreme Court is appointed some years later, 1944, to look into the matter because of the continuing agitation on behalf of Elias and Gordon. By whom? Now, I understand uh, they've got significant support within the Labor Party in Darling Harbour. And we've got a, a Labor government in power, and there's agitation on their behalf uh, from um, the families of the, of the two convicted men, but also um, representations within the Labor Party. So this continues. And the... the the key issue is still Farncombe's, Captain Farncombe's um, statement that he believed personally that these men were guilty. And it's important to remember that two members of the court martial were his officers and that the, the sense that there may have been a, a miscarriage of justice because their will was overborne by their commanding officer. It comes up in the High Court proceedings. The High Court say, no, 
There's nothing on the face of the court martial, the transcript or anything to su suggest that they were, uh, their will was overborne by Captain Farnton. But nonetheless, the issue comes back to Justice Maxwell in his inquiry. And Justice Maxwell goes through the proceedings again in some detail, goes through the transcript again in some detail, and said that as far as he was concerned, they got a fair trial and a fair result was arrived at. But he, he, he still was of the view that Captain Farnham should not have uh, advocated um, personally, his personal conviction. Um, he thought that that was a substantial irregularity, but still not a miscarriage of justice. He still believed they should have been convicted. So are we saying essentially in 1944 that this has been looked at by a number of good legal minds and court martials are still a reliable way of dealing with matters of naval discipline? Yes. Uh, it seems very clear that there might have been concerns with um, aspects of procedure, but the overall effect was just. And I'm sure there was some um, size of relief in Navy office. James Goldrick, I know that I, I did want to ask you about Elias and Gordon, because I'm sure our viewers are thinking, well, what happened to these two? But you've also got a view of the way court marshals are kind of understood in this period? It's more uh, to do with Maxwell's uh, commission of inquiry, which is very interesting because Maxwell makes the point that there's no motive stated. But then he quotes Farnkin's letter. And he quotes the abnormal, unnatural, and perhaps perverse state of mind. There is a story which was given to me by the doctor of the Australia who had been present when Riley was interviewed by Commander Armstrong. And Surgeon Lieutenant Stenning, Malcolm Stenning as he then was, who only died a few years ago, um, was the only person who was um, privy to that deposition who was in Sydney at the time. The Navy made no attempt to make that part of the story available. They may not even have given Maxwell the um, the, in, the uh, transcripts of the interrogations. And of course, the commission, and um, David and Cameron would confirm this, is not bound in the same way a court is uh, in terms of ev evidence. But Stenning says that he actually met Maxwell at a dinner. And the subject was raised. And Maxwell actually, I mean, it's all most improper. But Maxwell basically says to Stenning, according to Stenning many years later, uh, that he didn't think they were guilty because there was no motive. Stenning then proceeds to give him the motive in words of one syllable. And my sense is, and this is what Stenning believed, that Maxwell realised that there was a motive, but that it was not in the interests of either of the men for that motive to be publicised, nor was it in the interests of the Navy, and they were guilty. Mm. So he's, again, he's walked this fine, he's continued to walk the same fine line which Farncom walked. Um, he's trying to be just because, of course, in that time and place, if that motive had been publicised, the two men would have know, been would have excoriated. Been, yes, they would have been in an even worse position than, than, than they were. Look, our time is uh, rapidly running to an end. So let me, if I could, and I'll start with you, Mike Carlton, is just give us one thing that you think we should take from this unfortunate tragic incident from 1942. One thing that we should take from it and perhaps that you might uh, invite our viewers to reflect on it in a little more detail. Mike Carlton. Well, it's interesting how far we have come, uh, both the Navy and, and Australian society. The, uh, the homosexual aspect of the whole thing were kept absolutely quiet uh, from that day pretty much to this. Uh, out of a sense of shame or, or whatever, we can't really judge. But homosexuality then was a crime. Uh, you could go to jail for the abominable crime of buggery, as they called it. So that would have been extremely prejudicial to uh, the two killers. Yes, it would have been. So it was not mentioned at the trial. Maxwell, the, uh, who ran the inquiry, didn't know about it until, as James has pointed out, Stenning told him over at dinner one night at the Australian Club. Uh, and the whole thing was hushed up ever after. So survivors of the ship long after the war would not talk about it, for they felt it brought shame on the Navy and the ship. And there is no mention of it whatsoever in Herman Gill's history, two-volume history, of the RAN during World War II. It's absolutely uh, just not mentioned. So there was this sense of shame and concealment that, uh, that lasted for many, many years. Today, uh, of course, we, we view homosexuality in a very different light, uh, and so does the Navy, and it's you know, part and parcel of life. So we have come a very long way. Uh, 
But in the end, I agree with everybody else that justice was done in the case of this court martial. Thank you. James? I think I'd uh, back Mike's point. Uh, I think it's shown how far society and the Navy have evolved. I suppose for me, it's an object lesson uh, in command for um, how Farncombe handled it. He did well, you think? I think he did extraordinarily well. It's very interesting. Um, Maxwell implicitly, in fact, I think he ex explicitly says that it, it, the prosecution was other than the irregularity, which was a serious one, very well conducted. When the documents were taken to the United Kingdom by the former secretary to the chief of naval staff after the war and they reviewed that they were also quite impressed by how Farncombe handled it. Of course, after he had to retire uh, after the war from alcoholism brought on by the stress of being in continuous command for the entire war, um, when he basically got himself into AA and got over his alcoholism, he actually qualified as a lawyer. And you, do you think this gave him a solicitor? taste for it? Did this I give think him a taste did. for Well, it? for instance, he maintained his friendship with Ratke um, for the rest of his life. Uh, and indeed, and Rapke tells the story, having had this terrible stoush with him in the court martial, as Rapke thinks he's packing up to leave, Farncombe sends for him and asks him to be his secretary, the secretary to the captain of the ship. So, as I say, I think it's a wonderful instance of command. One point, of course, about the men, I think, is what happened to them. And uh, Maxwell recommended 12 years. Um, and then there was a some question as to whether there should be further remission. Both were released in 1950. Um, Elias ended up uh, becoming, uh, living in suburbia, becoming a, an amateur artist um, and dying in the 90s. We're not quite sure what happened to Gordon. Um, he does seem to have been part of the Sydney scene um, for many years um, and is almost certainly dead. Uh, but as Mike said, they passed out of history at that point. Mm. David Leeds. <coughs> um, two things. One that James has just talked about, this relationship that developed between Rap Rapke and, and Farncombe that uh, started off with, uh, with uh, Rapke thinking he'd really done his dash by opposing the captain so, so vigorously during the court-martial, but ending up uh, with them both as lawyers. And in fact, in fact uh, Rapke ended up as a rear admiral, um, the same as Farncombe, because he ended up being the uh, judge advocate for the Navy as well as a, uh, a county court judge in Victoria. So he had a very successful uh, legal career um, and, and, uh, and, and Farncombe followed him into the law, uh, as mentioned. But the other thing that I think is quite fascinating is just the pace with which this all unfolded. The murder uh, took place in March, the court martial in April, so less than perhaps four weeks later, the court martial itself uh, lasted a few days. The decision of the, of the court was delivered within a few hours. Um, and then the matter was in the High Court um, on appeal by the end of April. Um, that pace of, of dealing with um, a very serious matter is something that we simply don't see today in any criminal trial or any court martial. So six weeks then would probably be what six weeks, uh, six years now. Well, it could well be. <laughs> yeah. Could, that, and that's just the investigative phase, perhaps. So, mm -hmm. so very interesting here that that they could deal with such a serious matter, and from the reviews from the High Court um, appeal, from Maxwell's review, um, seemingly uh, in a in a just, fair, and equitable outcome, but deal with it in that period of time. I think that's quite fascinating. It is. Cameron, uh, what do we take from it in your perspective? I think there are two really important points to me. The first is the constitutional point. 1942, uh, you have this murder on board HMAS Australia, and it contributes to turning a fractious federation into a nation uh, in the most unexpected way. Uh, and I don't think that that's really appreciated uh, at all. The well, I can venture the view I don't think that it is at all. I think you're absolutely <laughs> right. I think many of our viewers of this program will probably be wanting to look at these bits of legislation, how they fit it or don't fit together. So I think you've laid something important in front of us there. The other aspect to me is the significance for this incident for the contemporary debate on military discipline and military justice. To have this matter heard in a civil court would have had dramatic operational consequences. And I don't think that the issue would be any different today. So we have a debate about whether these sorts of matters should be dealt with in a civilian court. 
or by court martial. And I think that this uh, goes very strongly towards the argument that a court martial is the appropriate forum to deal with an operational incident such as this. So in that debate, you think this helps at least you fall on one side of that debate? Yes. Look, gentlemen, thank you very much for what's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, can I please uh, thank joining us today uh, Mike Carlton, uh, James Goldrick, David Letts and Cameron Moore. Sally, that's all we've got time for. We hope that you enjoyed this discussion and that you join us for the next in our Naval History podcast series. Bye for now.